Well, welcome to another Dose of Science. And today we'll give you a couple of updates on what is happening in the COVID world. Uh, we'll also delve into PFAS, perfluoroalkyl substances. Uh, we'll learn a little bit about mosquito bites and what to do about them and uh, about the Mandela effect. And of course, we will also have our interesting animal update. All right, we're going to start with a little bit of a, an update uh, about uh, uh, what is happening in the world of COVID. So let me get started with, uh, with that. Vitamin D, of course, has been discussed extensively in relation to uh, uh, COVID. The idea being that if you are uh, low in vitamin D in your blood, you are at greater risk for contracting the disease. There also have been stories about taking vitamin D in order to fight symptoms, etc. A lot of stuff published, uh, it's all over the place. The most recent uh, uh, trial is an interesting one because it looked at vitamin D levels uh, in uh, people who were then diagnosed with uh, COVID-19. And the question was, uh, was this predictive? Could you determine whether or not someone was more likely to be diagnosed with uh, COVID-19 if they had low blood levels of, of vitamin D? And in this particular study, uh, the answer is, is, is no. The evidence did not support this. Uh, however, uh, of course, this does not mean that we should uh, you know, throw vitamin D under the bus uh, because we know that vitamin D does have an effect on bone structure. We also know that in North America in the winter, people don't get enough vitamin D. Uh, we also know that supplements, you know, in the ballpark of 1,000 to 2,000 IU uh, are not uh, in any way dangerous. So uh, it's kind of uh, nutritional insurance to take vitamin D supplements. But as you can see by this study, it is not going to prevent uh, COVID-19. And there certainly is no evidence that um, taking supplements of COVID-19 once symptoms appear will have anything to do with those uh, uh, symptoms. <clears throat> Vitamin D, of course, is often referred to as the sunshine vitamin, which is a misnomer. Uh, sunshine does not contain vitamin. Sunshine is just radiation. Uh, however, it is energetic enough <clears throat> to convert some compounds that are found in the skin into vitamin uh, D. And uh, of course, in the winter here in North America, we don't go out all that much. And also because of the angle of the sun relative to the atmosphere, a lot of the wavelengths that would trigger the formation of vitamin D are actually filtered out by the atmosphere. Another very interesting study uh, that <laughs> recently appeared is about the administration of anal oxygen. And uh, this research was prompted by the shortage of ventilators, which of, of course was an issue early in this, uh, in this pandemic. And then furthermore, shortages of uh, equipment to administer oxygen. And in this case, uh, the researchers looked at the possibility of administering a solution that contained a high concentration of oxygen uh, anally. A very, very interesting story, and it takes us back to a, a demonstration uh, way back in the 1970s when it was determined that a, a special uh, molecule called perfluorodecalin was able to absorb a great deal of oxygen. And what you're looking at here is a very legitimate picture of a mouse underneath the level of this liquid, totally immersed. And yet the mouse is, is uh, uh, perfectly uh, okay with this because it is inhaling some of the liquid, uh, but the liquid is full of oxygen. It is saturated with oxygen. So the, the animal is getting oxygen in, in its uh, lungs. Isn't that what and, they did in the movie, The Abyss? Yes, exactly, okay. exactly, yeah. So it's really fascinating. I mean, especially given the fact that uh, the mouse doesn't drown. So that although the liquid fills the lungs, it's able to just extract the oxygen and then the liquid doesn't seem to bother it. So here's what um, they did in this experiment. And, and this is the uh, so-called abstract graphic that comes with this uh, scientific uh, paper. <clears throat> so it was 
all triggered by an observation of, of the loach, which is this rather unusual worm-like creature, which apparently breathes through its intestine. So this started the, uh, this uh, whole issue, and they made up a solution of perfluorodecalin. And as you can see, immersed animals, uh, mice uh, and uh, pigs, for example, and rats, they immersed their rear end in the solution so that it would be absorbed into their uh, uh, anus. And it turns out that uh, when they were prevented from breathing, and uh, I'm sure that you know uh, animal rights activists will have uh, something to say about such experiments. And as you can see in the graphic, the, uh, the animals had kind of a muzzle on in order to prevent them from breathing. And yet they were okay because they were absorbing the oxygen through the rectum. Joe, it's not, it's not April 1st, is it? No, it isn't. It isn't. It's a real legitimate study. And as you can see, they infer that in extreme situations where there may not be ventilation equipment uh, available, then this solution uh, saturated with, uh, with oxygen may be used to uh, uh, introduce oxygen rectally into the patient. Interesting stuff. Uh, of course, it is unlikely to ever be put into, into practice, but academically, it certainly is interesting, especially the fact that this perfluorodecalin has such an amazing ability to uh, dissolve um, oxygen. And we'll talk a little bit later about some of the downsides of this, uh, perf these perfluorinated compounds. All right, so uh, Jonathan, maybe you can pick it up from here with uh, some other recent events in the struggle against COVID. How, how can I beat that, Joe? I mean, but to, to, to link it back to the sunshine vitamins, so you have to stick the oxygen where the sun don't shine. Is what <laughs> Good line. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I wanna talk about this um, thing that's been uh, on the, uh, it's been shared in, on social media for uh, about a month now, I would say. And I want to start with the truth, which is that no vaccinated people do not uh, shed the virus. Um, and I, I, I want to show you some examples of what's been uh, what's been shared on social media. Um, this stuff has been um, found by uh, Dr. G uh, David Gorski uh, for, from Science Based Medicine. And um, yeah, that's it's sort of I mean, here it says the latest COVID-19 anti-vaccine disinformation. But that was at the beginning of the month. There has been so much more because there's, there's new stuff coming out every every week now. Um, but here we are, here's a business uh, that is saying, uh, don't enter if you have received any COVID vaccine in the last four weeks. And they are justifying this by saying that they have a pregnant staff member and this is for her protection and ours. Um, we have somebody else on Twitter saying, you know, I did not consent to other people's vaccines shedding their gross little menstruation disrupting spike proteins all around my fertile bod. Um, we have uh, we have this gym here uh, in um, in British Columbia, I, I believe, uh, that is saying that the unknown health effects of the RNA vaccines, uh, as well as reported side effects such as viral shedding and seizures and death, are not covered by our by our liability. Um, so this is um, this is quite uh, quite silly. Oh, I'm here, of course. We have uh, Dr. Naomi Wolf, uh, who is is uh, saying that there's a Facebook group where anybody can join and report what they think are vaccine side effects. And she's saying, well, lots of people are, are having bleeding events and clotting events, or they're bleeding oddly when they're around vaccinated women. So even they themselves have not been vaccinated, but when they're around other women who have been vaccinated, all of a sudden it all uh, goes to hell. So just for the record, yes. Dr. Naomi Wolf is, is the wrong kind of doctor to be talking about this. Don't yes, don't think indeed. that just because she her name is Dr. Naomi Wolf, she has any kind of medical training. But she has a blue check mark, Ada. So she's been verified by Twitter. Um, so well, because that means she exists. Yeah, she, right? she she exists, and she is. This account is indeed the account of Dr. Naomi Wolf. That's what the hang on. Just the, just this week, our, they refused to verify me. So do I exist? Then no, you don't. Isn't hey. our pal Dr. Christian Northrup also into this? Because I seem to. Oh remember. well, yes. I seem to remember that uh, she actually uh, she has a grandchild in a school in Florida. Yes, and, uh, and uh, the school prevented teachers who are vaccinated from coming into school. 
Yeah, so there is there's a private academy in uh, Florida that if it's not run by anti-vaxxers, then it has been influenced certainly in its decision making process by the anti-vaccine movement. Um, and they sent a letter to their teachers uh, a month ago or so saying that in the fall, if you're a teacher at our academy and you're vaccinated against COVID, there may not be a job for you because you'll be shedding infectious particles and we want to protect our staff. Uh, so all of this is nonsense. Uh, and what I'm showing here is the full, the virus, the coronavirus in red uh, at the bottom of the screen and this little spike protein in green. Uh, and these are not the same things, right? So the spike protein is part of the coronavirus at its surface, but it is not the whole virus. And these vaccines that have been approved for use in Canada and elsewhere, uh, none of them contain the virus itself. They all contain genetic information for our body to make the spike protein in green here. So there's, there's no reason to believe that you would be shedding something that is infectious. In fact, the brilliance of these vaccines is that they cannot give you the disease. They are not what we call live attenuated uh, vaccines, which do exist for, for, a few, uh, for a few illnesses, but they are actually just the instructions to make a part of the virus that your immune system will recognize as foreign and will thus uh, make uh, antibodies against it and will prepare you uh, when you actually uh, do encounter the coronavirus. Uh, and in fact, if this were true, right, if this claim that people who have been vaccinated against the coronavirus, that we are shedding uh, infectious particles and we're contaminating people and making them sick, we would be seeing it in the data. It would be quite dramatic. So on the left here, I'm just showing the, uh, the vaccination in Canada um, in, um, over time since, since, since January 1st. And as you can see, it's been going up and up and up and up. And on the right, you see the number of cases in Canada and the same time, um, the same time uh, zone is in the, the red square uh, in, both of these, uh, in both of these graphs. And, uh, you know, we had this, this second wave and then it dipped down. And, and then, you know, roughly in, uh, in late February, early March, it started to go up again back when very few people were vaccinated. And it's been going all the way down very recently in the past few weeks as vaccination has gone way, way, way up. So this is not the kind of data that we would be seeing if people were indeed shedding infectious particles after being vaccinated, which again is biologically impossible. Uh, but of course, uh, the people who are clamoring for this, this particular trope will say that, well, you know, Pfizer knows that you can shed uh, and that these, the, the, the shedding of the vaccine is affecting pregnant women. And what they have uh, focused on is a particular document uh, by Pfizer, which of course makes one of the coronavirus vaccines. Uh, and it is a very thick uh, protocol for the testing of their RNA vaccine. And somewhere in there, uh, you will see um, a particular section on exposure during pregnancy. And this is being touted as the smoking gun that shows that C. Pfizer knows that if a pregnant woman has been exposed to the vaccine by inhalation or by skin contact, uh, something bad is going to happen. Now, of course, this is not what this is. This is the kind of legalese uh, that is common in a lot of research protocols where they're trying to take into account any potential situation that might arise while they are testing this vaccine in human beings and what to do about it. And in this particular case, if a woman is uh, participating in one of these trials and she somehow becomes exposed to the, the vaccine liquid because a vial tips over or what have you, uh, and there's skin contact, this has to be reported. This has to be taken into account. In, you know, in case something were to happen, now again, if this is completely biologically implausible, but just in case, this is what this uh, piece of verbiage means. It does not mean that Pfizer knows that shedding the vaccine uh, is toxic for, for, for pregnant women. Um, now, a uh, quick little uh, aside, and I'll be, I'll be writing more about this uh, this week for, for the OSS, but interestingly enough, there, there, there are some preliminary uh, studies now that have come out looking at you know, do, do women shed uh, anything of the coronavirus uh, in, for example, in their breast milk? Because uh, there's been some, some interest in what do we do with, with breastfeeding women? Should they be getting vaccinated or not? Because they were not part of the clinical trials, and that's a problem. Um, now, as it turns out, again, this is preliminary data. 
but the RNA from the vaccine, which is the genetic code for the spike protein of the coronavirus, um, so far has not really been detected in human milk. I believe there was one case at some point. Um, but so if it does, you know, um, you know, if, if it is present in human milk, it is extremely rare. And again, it is just the genetic instructions to make of the spike protein. It's not uh, uh, it's not the virus itself. But what is interesting is that uh, there have been a few studies now that have shown that antibodies against the coronavirus that are produced by the mother after being vaccinated can be detected in their breast milk. And so there is this idea that um, the, uh, the baby that is being breastfed might uh, earn some protection from the coronavirus by receiving uh, the antibodies from, from their, their mother through, through the milk. And uh, last thing that I want that I want to point out, because you know every week there is more uh, scaremongering from a small minority of anti-vaccine activists online, uh, and they will come up with any sort of potential reason to scare people into not getting vaccinated. This is the number of people who have received at least one dose of COVID nineteen vaccine in the world, uh, and you know we are we are in the hundreds of millions of people. So if the vaccine was as dangerous as anti-vaccine activists would like you to believe, we would know this by now. It would, be, it would have been a catastrophic event, and that is absolutely not what is seen. Well, as you mentioned, uh, all of the vaccines basically accomplish the same end. They, they provoke the production of the, uh, of the spike protein. And uh, so that, that you know, brings up the question of mixing the vaccines. A lot of people are now concerned. They got the first one, AstraZeneca, should they wait until get Pfizer, et cetera? And of course, no one can say this for sure because the trials have not been done. But uh, as sort of an educated guess, uh, what is really different here is the route by which one arrives at the, the final uh, production of, of the uh, uh, spike protein. So in theory, one should be able to mix. I mean, the, the analogy that I've used is, is like taking a trip. You can go to Toronto by plane, by car, by by uh, uh, train, whatever, you get there. The end result is the same, but you have taken different paths with possibly different risks, right? Going by car is not the same as going by, by plane. So I, I think that we may be looking at a situation like that here, is, is that chances are that when you mix the vaccine, the end result will be okay because you're just uh, triggering the production of the spike protein but there may be some questions to ask about the, you know, what happens along the way. Anyway, so we need a segue here now to uh, Ada's uh, mosquitoes. And well, I have an idea. Yes. Well, just you were talking about rectal oxygen, and we can definitely say that mosquitoes are a pain in the ass. <laughs> I, I, I was thinking of the question of whether or not uh, uh, the uh, virus can be transmitted by mosquitoes, which of course at first was a, a question that was raised and was a legitimate question at one time because, you know, mosquitoes do transfer blood, etc. But we know now for sure that that is not the case. You cannot catch mm -hmm. COVID-19 from a mosquito bite uh, or even from a human bite. All right. But suppose you get bitten by a mosquito. What do you do? Yeah, I, I don't know about you guys, but I've been getting bit by a lot of them recently. The weather's getting a lot nicer and I'm trying to spend a lot of time outside, but it's kind of horrible being covered in mosquito bites head to, t head to toe. But I started wondering because they sell so many products um, in the pharmacies that are said to treat um, the itchiness of a mosquito bite. Um, something not to prevent bites, but rather to treat them once they've already happened. Um, and I really started wondering if any of them work. So good things. There are studies on this. I went and found some and I read them. And it turns out that a lot of the products sold to prevent or to treat mosquito bites are actually homeopathic in nature. And as we know, and hopefully you know as well, audience, um, homeopathy is not exactly a science. It's rather a pseudoscience. Um, and it's based on the idea of serial dilutions. So there's a decent chance that there is no um, functional active molecule, even in this product that you're applying to your mosquito bite. Um, although it still seems to work. And even in studies, we do see a certain amount of um, relief when you have um, applying these homeopathic products to mosquito bites. But the problem is applying 
any lotion or any cream or gel or any kind of topical product to a mosquito bite is going to grant you a certain amount of relief. So even if you don't have a special anti um, itching cream to apply to your mosquito bite, even just applying normal hand or face cream would help at least a little bit. Um, but if we can put the homeopathic ones aside for a second, um, the most common type of afterbite, at least that I grew up with, um, was called afterbite and it's ammonia based. Um, and fascinatingly, um, the studies, the double, double blind placebo controlled studies do show that it works. It does reduce. Now it's a subjective feeling of itchiness. There's no way to test that except to ask people how itchy and painful they feel. So of course that's, there's a lot of room for bias. There's a lot of room for error, but there was a fairly big sample size in this and it was placebo controlled double blind. So at least according to this study, um, ammonia solutions, topically applied ammonia solutions do seem to help, but we have no idea why. Not any of the papers, there's a lot of ideas, but there's no consensus on why this actually does work. Um, and even looking back at the history of it, it turns out that this has its origins in an old wives' tale, which makes a lot of sense because ammonia used to be much more so than now, although still now is a, um, a common cleaning um, material. And so it essentially started as an old wives' tale, diluting ammonia and putting it on mosquito bites um, just to help children. And it seemed to work, so we kept doing it. And now we do it with commercial products, but we still don't know why it works, although it does seem to, um, which is just fascinating to me. Um, but if you are looking for something that we know the mechanism of action, there are topical antihistamines, so essentially topical allergy meds, and those do seem to work quite well, although they have a very large um, rate of allergic reaction. So if you've never tried that kind of antibiotic before, you probably want to put it just on like a tiny bit of your skin and nowhere, nowhere super sensitive. See if you have a reaction, and if you don't, you can then apply it to your mosquito bites. And the other ones that really work um, are ones that contain lidocaine, because funny enough, if you numb the part of your body that's itching, it doesn't itch anymore. Um, so you have some options if you get itchy, although probably the best option is just to avoid getting bit in the first place. Um, and I wrote a big article on that a couple of years ago, actually. Um, and I, I really, it's one of my favorite articles, only because mosquitoes are omnipresent in our lives and there's so many products to try to repel them to treat them to attract them to things that are not human so that they leave us alone and the more and more evidence i read the more and more i just came to the conclusion that good old-fashioned deet is where it's at the deet it works well it's safe it's cheap it's non-toxic i am just it's a chemical dying. Everything yes, you're a chemical. And, uh, I can tell you that there's a whole anti deet community out there. Oh yes. And for a those people anti community about everything. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for those people, I would recommend they look into permethrin, which um, is another licensed in Canada at least um, mosquito repellent, and it does seem to work fairly well, not quite as well as DEET in the clinical trials or in the studies rather, but still decently well. So if you are anti DEET for whatever reason. One, I don't think you should be, but I'm not going to waste my energy trying to convince you. Instead, you should probably just buy permethrin. And even though COVID cannot be um, con uh, spread through blood um, mosquito bites and through blood from mosquito bites, there are lots of diseases that can be. And just because we now have vaccines for COVID-19 doesn't mean we need to stop worrying about all the other diseases and zoonotic issues that could be Absolutely. coming from Malari mosquitoes. Mal malaria is the most frequently diagnosed disease in the world. So, yep. But mosquitoes love CO2. They're attracted to carbon dioxide. So one way to stop being bitten is to stop breathing. Don't yeah, breathe. as, yeah. If you breathe That's through your intestine, you're, you'll be fine. Yeah, they, they don't bite dead people. All right, let, let me uh, share my uh, screen uh, once more and go on to a book that uh, I've been delving into. It is a bestseller on New York Times list. It's by Shauna Swan. Uh, it's called Countdown. And uh, Shauna Swan has been active in uh, this area of sperm counts for a long time. She's now at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. And uh, the book is all about the declining uh, sperm counts. And uh, course, uh, all of the concerns that eventually human survival will be at risk because uh, of the lack of, of sperm. And all of this uh, is based upon endocrine disruptors, chemicals that can interfere with, with hormones.
Now, I must point out, though, that while Shana does make a, a strong case for declining sperm counts, not everyone agrees with this. And uh, there are a number of studies that have been published that, that uh, uh, claim that the sperm counts that she references have not been properly arrived at, that there were methodological uh, differences. But in any case, um, endocrine disruption is a huge area of, of research. These are chemicals that can either behave like hormones or block the action of hormones. There are literally thousands of papers published on this every year. There are journals totally devoted to this. There are textbooks devoted to endocrine disruptors. And uh, there's a very interesting toxicological issue that appears with these compounds because it turns out that they may actually be more active at a smaller dose than at a higher dose. This is the so-called monotonic, non-monotonic response. <clears throat> now, most of the time in toxicology, uh, we refer to the dose response curve as essentially being linear. That is the greater the dose, the greater the effect. Uh, and that obviously does seem to make sense because we know that the cornerstone of toxicology was, was laid about 500 years ago by Paracelsus with the classic uh, dictum, uh, sola dosis facit venenum, only the dose makes the poison. Well, this non-monotonic dose response is very interesting because the theory here is that uh, at a small dose, you can have an effect that you don't see at a larger dose. So normally what we see is a dose response curve where the increase in dose results in an increased response. However, in a non-monotonic situation, it turns out that, that you reach a point where there is no response and then you decrease the dose and you get a response again. As you might um, infer, this is rather controversial. Uh, but it is an interesting observation. It's called hormesis, the hormesis uh, effect. And the theory is that, that uh, these chemicals, these endocrine disruptors have this non-monotonic response. So therefore, when one tests what happens in the body at a large dose, and from that infers that nothing is going to happen, a smaller dose may not be correct. And the can, can, can I just say, I, 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 I thought that hormesis was that at lower doses, it would be protective, but at lower doses, it would be harmful? Not necessarily. It just means that there's a different effect at lower dose than, than one would expect okay. at, a, at a higher dose. It can be protective or, or, or it can be the opposite. Huh. Uh, it can be either. So uh, the compounds that now are in the news a great deal are the so-called alkyl substances. And these are molecules that have a string of carbon atoms and a periphery of fluorine atoms. The carbon-fluorine bond is very strong. So these are very persistent molecules in the environment. They're called forever chemicals. And we find them in all kinds of places because they have greaseproofing and waterproofing properties. So you find them in pizza boxes. You find them in the bags of, of uh, microwave popcorn, <clears throat> stain-resistant carpets, rain, rainwear so that the water doesn't go through. And of course, chemicals from these can leach out into the environment. They can get into food, they can get into drinking water. And we all have some of these PFASs in, in, in our blood. Uh, one of the major uh, uses is in these uh, fire extinguishing foams because they coat the fire, they put it out very, very quickly, but it gets into groundwater from, from here. And then of course, Teflon is one of these perfluoro compounds and people have been throwing out their cookware is very, very unfortunate because the finished product here does not contain any leachable perfluoro uh, compounds. They are used in the manufacture of it, but the finished product, which is a polymer of, of these fluorinated compounds does not, not leach out. <clears throat> anyway, we heard a lot about these uh, perfluorinated compounds in a recent movie, Dark Waters, which uh, is based on the true life story of DuPont, where some of these compounds, mostly PFOA, perfluorooctanoic acid, which was used in the manufacture of other perfluorinated compounds, le uh, leached out into the groundwater and was uh, associated with cancer. And it probably is a cause and effect relationship. 
it's a very interesting movie uh, to watch. And uh, recently, uh, there has been concern, believe it or not, about underwear, because now everyone is looking into every possible connection with these uh, perfluoral co compounds. And uh, this uh, underwear is uh, women's underwear, and it is to be used uh, uh, for periods because it has an amazing ability to absorb uh, liquid. But now it turns out that it contains uh, PFAS. And a study uh, just recently done, uh, you can see some of the results here, showed that indeed you find some of these compounds in the underwear. Then the question comes up, so what? Because nobody is eating uh, this kind of underwear. But the- Unless they're is, edible underwear. I was gonna say there is edible kind. underwear. Yes, I wasn't gonna bring that up, but there, there certainly is edible underwear. Uh, uh, which incidentally you, you buy in sex shops. So that's the connection there. Anyway, uh, so they have been looking into whether or not there's dermal exposure. You know, can, can this stuff go through the skin? So here is one study, which of course, uh, the people who are now raising this alarm about the underwear refer to, and uh, they find that it is indeed possible that some of it goes through the skin and has effects, but you can see this was in a murine model. And for those people who don't know what that reference is, murines are rats and, and mice. So this again is a study in rodents and uh, it's a long way from showing any kind of an effect in, in, in people. Now the study was done by, by uh, uh, this group called Mammovation. Yeah, and uh, uh, you can kind of guess from the, the name here that they tend to be rather alarmist and they're looking for toxic substances and uh, they do find some and then they have uh, solutions and they end up, uh, you know, co coming to some interesting conclusions. Uh, Thinks is one company that uh, sells kind of underwear and it was one that was found to have these PFASs and after uh, this group raised the alarm, now in their uh, on their website, in their claims, they no longer refer to PFAS uh, being absent as they were doing before. Uh, now they just say that it is free from PFOA, which may be the case, but there are many, many other fluorinated compounds than that. So, you know, they, they've opened up this kind of worms here and it's, it's kind of interesting, but they end up recommending a specific kind of underwear. And uh, when you look through, uh, their website, it turns out that Isle uh, Underwear actually funded some of that study. It doesn't mean that it's invalid. Anyway, it's just interesting uh, connection here with, uh, with the underwear and the perfluoro compounds. But of course, <clears throat> this would be a very, very small contributor to the, the compounds that we are exposed to uh, overall. But that's the story of uh, PFAS in, in uh, underwear, yet another thing to worry about. But it's also interesting that this underwear exists because for a lot of women, it is replacing the pads and it's replacing the, the tampons. Ada, what do you think? What, because I'm the only woman here? Come on. Well, Not you are the only woman that. here. What can I tell you? <laughs> um, there's, yeah, there's, I... no, there's no sex change going on here. If... Um, I've never tried period panties. I've actually always been kind of curious, but they, they, they're expensive because they're meant to replace long-term use yeah. of um, menstrual products like pads and tampons. Um, so, I mean, if you want to buy me some, I'm not going to complain, but the, it's interesting to me because it seems like the best reusable option for people that don't want to use internal products, because for people that want to use internal products, there are reusable tampons and also um, menstrual cups, like the Diva cup, the salt cup, there's a billion brands now. Um, and those are actually very well approved of. It's it's interesting when you look at the studies of their use and their approval rating. Um, if people keep using them past one month, they have a really high approval rating of them. And if they stop using them in the first month, they hated them, um, mm. which makes a lot of sense. But some people can't or don't want to use internal products to stop uh, absorb their menstrual fluids. So these are really good options. Um, also, I just anecdotally, I've heard a lot of friends really like them for sleeping because it's a lot more comfortable in the long run. Right. And with these uh, perfluoro compounds, the fact is that if you look for them, you will find them. 
because they are ubiquitous in the in the environment. Of course, the question is, what are they really doing? And you know, as we've stated many times, the uh, the presence of a chemical cannot be equated to the presence of risk. Uh, we need to look deeper into that. But I want to uh, just uh, talk about something else here that I came across, which I find absolutely fascinating. And this is the Mandela effect. And it was introduced about a decade ago by this lady, Fiona Broom, uh, who identifies herself as a paranormal consultant. Uh, not exactly clear what that is, but of course it brings up a lot of questions. But uh, she got into this game uh, because she seemed to remember that Nelson Mandela had died in prison in the 1980s uh, and then found out that this wasn't true. But she was absolutely sure that this had happened. So this was the launch of the so-called Mandela uh, effect. Uh, because so many people believed that Mandela, in fact, had died in prison. Now, we know that this is not true. We know that Nelson Mandela died in 2013. I mean, that is an absolute fact. But when you ask people, huge numbers of people believed that he had died previously while he was in, in jail. So the Mandela effect is a phenomenon uh, when large numbers of people believe that something happened, even though we know that it didn't, even though that it isn't, uh, isn't true. Now, this lady, Broom, believes that what she remembers is actually correct. But we are living in multiple universes, and somehow there was a crossover of these universes. I mean, I, I can't even say this with a straight, straight face. but It's the only logical explanation, Joe. It is the only logical explanation. So that what she remembers really was the truth, but then it got all confused because she somehow transferred into the parallel universe where it didn't happen in that way. So this is the uh, whole business. And of course, she introduces terms like quantum and uh, uh, nuclear particles and... And, uh, you know, and the TV show physics. Sliders and... Oh, ab absolutely. Absolutely. And there's even a, a, a theory, oh you know, that it was uh, the European Organization for Nuclear Research that started all of this because their experiments shifted us to an alternate reality. And get this, that alternate reality is where Donald Trump became president. Now, that makes a lot of sense. I will say this. <laughs> we really are living in the darkest timeline. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But unfortunately... He really was president. <laughs> it, was, it wasn't an alternate reality. So, of course, the question is whether or not we can actually trust our memory. And that's a very interesting question. For example, in the U.S., on surveys, a huge percentage of the population believed that Alexander Hamilton was president. And here was a, a study they, where they, they documented this, and they showed that more people believe that Alexander Hamilton was president than for some other presidents who they didn't believe were, were presidents. Mm. So it's a question of, is it misremembering or they just were never taught properly? But let me give you some examples of the Mandela effect because I find these really, really uh, interesting. Yep. <laughs> I love bears. Bears. Remember these? You, I mean, we. Yeah. I, re I remember reading these to the kids, right? All the good books. I have and if you were asked to fill in the blank here, the bears. Joe, you, bears. Forgot to, you forgot to remove one blank, though. <laughs> hey? You forgot to remove one blank written by. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. Well, don't look down there yet. All right. Most people would say. This, Berenstein, right? The, yeah. the Berenstein uh, bears. Uh, of course, that is not the case. Yeah. These are the Berenstein bears. And uh, so called because the authors, there were a couple called the Berensteins. But However, it, must be, it must be because of the surname Berenstein is so yeah, rare. It doesn't ring right. Yeah. But look, even TV Guide got hmm. it wrong. So it's not surprising that the, this thing, you know, got into into sort of common uh, language uh, as uh, Bernstein bears. Now here's another one. Luke, I am your father, right? He no. never said that. No, he says, he no said that. I am your father. No, yeah. I am your father. And uh, this 
very popular TV show. What was the title? Oh, oh. right. And for the we longest need, time, we I need Emily I, back for this. No, but I mean, so so I, I know I know the right and the wrong answer. But for the longest time, I because I don't watch the show, I thought it was Sex in the City, but it's not. It's Sex and the City. Exactly. Which it, doesn't uh, make sense. Why do believe that it's Sex in the City? But it's right. not. It's Sex and and the City. Yeah. Uh, so again, <clears throat> misremembering. And this one, uh, yes. <laughs> he's the guy uh, on the Monopoly box and on the game. And the question here is, what is wrong with that drawing? I'm not going to say, I know what it is. Ada, do you know what it is? I don't know. Is he not it, supposed to have like a monocle or something? That's right. He doesn't have a monocle. But it looks right, doesn't it? It, it looks, looks so right. right. But isn't now, that the question maybe is, we're... why do so many people believe it? And one answer that Mr. has been put forward the is they get yeah. confused with Mr. Peanut. <laughs> well, yeah. that's okay, because Mr. Peanut's dead. Didn't you see that viral yes. marketing campaign yes, earlier yes, this year? Yes. So weird. <laughs> then there is this one. Uh, in Forrest Gump, this is the famous chocolate remark. Right. What What is uh, Tom Hanks actually saying? I remember it as life is like a box of chocolates. I saw this movie for the first time last month, and I still couldn't tell you confidently. I thought it was life is like a box of chocolates. Okay, this this is <laughs> this is what is the prime answer that people give mm -hmm. that, that yeah, it that sounds right. Supposed to have said, he never said that. What he said was life was like a box of chocolates. Okay, so, so I got it. Yeah, okay. the, the, the second part close. was not, uh, okay. And uh, ah, yes. <laughs> I love this one. I love this one. There never was a movie uh, Shazam. Uh, and uh, the reason that people uh, think that is because there was Kazam. And I kind of, doesn't that doesn't sound right. Shazam sounds a lot better. And well, there is, is, there is now a movie called Shazam. It's a good movie, right? too. It's good, yeah, the superhero movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, this is one of my favorites because I have yes. used this line often in my cosmetics lecture. I, I start off the lecture actually saying by mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? And that is incorrect. There is no line mirror, mirror on the wall. It is magic mirror on the wall. And uh, then this is, is, I think, my favorite because so many times I have used this expression, I'd rather stick rusty needles in my eyeballs. Uh, it's <laughs> As it comes up in everyday of vernacular. Course. It's of from course. Terms of Endearment, and that, of course, is uh, 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 Jack Nicholson. And I don't even know where I got this, where I got the rusty. He did not say that. And I was shocked when I rewatched the movie. I, this, I, I would have bet on this this huh. one that that's what he said and that's not what he said he said i'd rather stick needles in my eyes huh. but i was you know absolutely convinced and now there's even the mandela effect i think there is if i remember it right <laughs> <laughs> so these uh you know uh, uh false memories it's it, it, it's very interesting it's funny how because, popular popular culture can take something and twist it and it becomes the new narrative. And people are surprised yeah. when you go back to the source material and go, no, that's not what it was. And you know what you always wonder is, where was the original twist? Mm -hmm. that, yeah. that, wh why, why do we remember Mirror, Mirror on the Wall? It must have come up somewhere because everyone thinks that that's what's said. So it's not like our imagination made it up. It stems yeah. from somewhere. Could have been so, an influential TV presenter on a special on, yeah. on television was widely watched that misquoted yeah. it, and you know, yeah. yeah, could have been a children's toy that like yeah. had a voice line that was wrong in it. There's so many options. Of course, the point of all of this is that we can't really trust our memories, right? We we can be so convinced that to remember something right, and and we know that you have ten people witnessing an accident, and you'll get ten different stories. They all remember mm -hmm. it uh, uh, differently. Mm. All right. Well, we've covered a lot of uh, topics here today, but of course, we're left with the highlight, which is Ada's animal uh, query. Fact. I love it. Okay, so this week we got porcupines, um, and porcupines have quills, and they're they can attack people with those quills, um, and they can throw the quills at a target. Of except course. they absolutely cannot. 
because that's a myth that a lot of people believe. That's the Porcupines, Mandela effect right there. That's the Mandela effect right there in action. Um, porcupines cannot throw their quills. They can't project them in any way. Um, and it's actually a really common veterinary injury um, that dogs come in with absolute mouthfuls of porcupine quills because the quills come out very easily on contact. Um, so dogs try to go, hey, what's that? <laughs> and wind up with a face full of quills. Um, you, might, you might find quills on the ground thinking that they were shot out, but it was just, I guess, the porcupine like rubbing against a tree or something and the, the, the quill falls yep. off. Or... Exactly. And also just like how our hairs naturally fall out with time, um, they do just naturally lose and regrow quills. Hmm. Um, and just one more interesting thing is their quills look a lot like the spikes or spines on a hedgehog, but those two species are completely unrelated. It's just an example of convergent evolution. Turns out putting a whole bunch of spikes on your back is a pretty good way to not get eaten. But can cobras pick you in the eye? Hmm. I don't know. Next time. Next, yes. <laughs> tune, tune in, 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 in that two time. Weeks. Tune in in two weeks and we'll find out whether or not cobras can spit you in the eye. Well, that's all we have for you today. Uh, but of course, you can always check in and see all of our previous episodes on the website where you are now watching us. So thanks for uh, tuning in. Thanks for watching. We hope that we've informed you and uh, even try to entertain you a little bit. So we'll see you again two weeks from now. Bye.